Okay. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm actually excited about today. Usually, I'm nervous. I am a bit nervous, but at the same time, I just feel excited because I do feel the Lord's going to do something amazing today. Amen. Amen. And okay, I've kind of written down what I want to say in case I lose myself, and I'll probably start off by following my notes. But I am expecting the Holy Spirit to just lead us, guide us, and I'm just wanting to have this own way today. Um, during the service, uh, you're all going to be involved. Um, don't worry, it's not going to be questions and answers. But I do want everybody to be involved because I believe today we are actually going to change the atmosphere, not only in this room, but over this country. And I, I, want, I, I really believe that, you know, you mark this day down in your diary, 31st of July, that you are going to see a change. You're going to actually notice the shift. And I do want you to grab that and hold on to that because it's important. Um, the expectations that we have, you know, they're not just expectations in our hearts and something for us to, to hide behind. They're something that we need to declare, to speak out, and let the enemy also know these expectations that we, we want to bring over this country. Um, so, I'll, as you all know, I am part of the healing rooms so, uh, ministry. So, today is going to be more or less about healing. Um, but the, the, the service is going to be in two parts. There's going to be a first part and a second part. At the end of the first part, we're going to join and pray together. And at the end of the second part, we're going to join and pray together. And as I go along, you'll, uh, hopefully you'll understand what's going on. Um, so just before we start, I'd just like to um, just open in prayer if we can. Oh, Father, Lord, we just want to give this, this day over to you right now, Father. We want to thank you, Lord, for your presence here this morning. We want to thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have been here throughout this morning, even as we just started worship this morning, Father, um, those songs were just amazing, you know, we want to be in that place, in the Holy of Holies, and I believe we are there today, Lord Jesus, and Father, Lord, we just want to ask that you have your way this morning, Lord, we just want to give over this whole service, this whole day to you, and Lord, that you will just have your way, Father, and Lord, if there's anything you want to speak to us individually about, Father, I pray that you will lay it on each and every person's heart here. I pray, Lord Jesus, that nobody in this congregation will leave this place this morning without knowing more of you, Father, and knowing about your love and who you are. So, Father, Lord, I just thank you for being here. I thank you, Lord, that you have placed a word in my heart, Father, to bring, and Lord, that this is your word got nothing to do with me. It's not about Philip. It's not about Philip being up here, Father, but it's about you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I just pray that you have your way this morning. We just welcome you, Lord. We welcome you in this place, Lord. We welcome you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I just come and Lord, just speak to us this morning. Come and speak to us. I ask this in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, I would like, um, there's going to be a lot of scriptures. You don't have to keep turning to the page. You don't have to project them. <laughs> okay. Um, I would like to start to open up with the following scripture. It's Matthew 18, verses 2 to 4. He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is great, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I look at this verse and I, I, I think to myself, what does it mean to become a child? And I'd just like to give an example. Of, is if we take a 10-year-old. If we take a 10-year-old and we look at a 10-year-old's um, way of thinking, um, there's a couple of things a 10-year-old would do. Okay, If a 10-year-old needs food, what, what do they do? They run straight to their parents and there's an expectation that the parents will give them food. 
If they need clothes, what do they do? They run to their parents again. Because there's an expectation that the parents will provide them with clothes. If they need help with their homework, again, even if their parents know or don't know what they're doing with their homework, they'll still go to their parents and expect uh, you know, that the parents will be able to solve questions and answers to do with homework. And finally, if a child gets hurt, again, the first thing they'll do is go to their parents. They don't actually just go, they run to their parents. Um, so what is the expectation that the child places on the parent? Is it not that, the, that they will solve anything that is at hand for that child? Um, if you put, as a parent, even if you play a trick on a child, a 10 year old, you know, they might be naive enough, I think, I don't know, <laughs> if I can't remember that far back, but a 10 year old, if you play a trick on them, they will actually believe that what you're doing is true. They don't understand that it's a trick because their expectation of the parent is, you know, they know everything. Okay, so, so basically parents cannot do anything wrong. So they think. Um, one thing I noticed which is in line with what I want to speak about today is that a child, when they get hurt, or fall down, scratch themselves, or, you know, and there's a sore on them, the first thing they'll do is run to the parent. And even though I don't have kids, I monitor these things, so... so. <laughs> um, is, what I find amazing is how, when the parent kisses the child's sore, okay, straight away, the child will either stop crying, or that crying will be reduced to a, by a huge level. So, um, where is the child putting their faith? Okay. Is it not in the parent's touch? Um, if, if my mommy or daddy kisses me, then the pain is going to go away. It's going to stop to hurt. Okay? Um, I think our problem as adults is that we um, prevent ourselves from understanding these simple things. Um, I just want to also just read quickly Matthew 6, verse 25 to 33. Yeah, this is a longer one. Um, okay, just think of yourself, the adults, right? So we, the children, they will just run to their parents, expectation is there, the parent will give them what they need, what their desire is at that moment, whether it's pain, suffering, clothes, food, whatever, the parents got the answer. Okay, so now I just want to follow up with Matthew 6, 25 to 33. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air, they do not sow, or reap, or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not, not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow, they do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Um, what I want to bring, what I want to bring to your attention is verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more important than food and the body more important than clothes? So I want you to try register in your mind what the Lord is telling us here. That life is more important than food and the body more important than clothes. The Lord tells us not to worry about food. Okay? And says life and the body is more important than those two things, food and clothes. Um, 
I could be opening a can of worms here, yeah, as the saying goes, but I, I don't believe the Lord, your Father in heaven, wants there to be a problem with your life, whether it's physical, emotional, or even financial. Um, someone else has the plans to mess up, and he is not called the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes by the name of Satan. And the Lord tells us not to worry about these things, but to eat, to seek His kingdom and His righteousness. And all these things will be given to you. Satan, on the other hand, does what? His fight is to destroy that relationship between you and God. Um, so what is Satan good at? Isn't, isn't he good at just deceiving us? Satan pours out worldly wisdom and knowledge Therefore, taking us away from God's wisdom and knowledge. Um, I just want to, let's see what God says. Um, so that you can understand where I'm going with this. Romans 12, verse 1 to 2. It's a good thing I marked everything. Romans 12, Therefore, I urge you, brothers... In, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Um, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Satan wants us to worry about food, clothes, and things like that. Why? Because that takes us, takes our eyes off the life and the body. Um, should, our not, should our eyes not be fixed on the tree of life? Unfortunately today, we seem to focus more on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, as, as adults especially, we are always trying to be knowledgeable with the Satan's ways. That's the worldly ways. Um, we are ones asking why more than children. Children have, have this habit of why does this work, how does this work, why did this happen, why that. If you look at adults, adults we tend to ask more questions than kids. Why did this earthquake happen? Why the tsunami? Why are people suffering? Why did this happen to that person? Or why, 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 for whatever other reason? And most of the times, these questions are asked. We actually place God as the bad person. Um, God could have prevented this. God could have done that or that. You know? um, but if God has a good, pleasing and perfect will, how can this knowledge of bad things be of Him? So, will God go back on His promises? Never. His promises are true. A child will not question their parents' role, yet we question our father's role. Um, I admit that today family and society has broken down, and unfortunately there are horrible deeds by, done by certain parents towards children. But Satan is the one breaking down households which leads to the breakdown in society, which in turn leads to the breakdown in the country and the nations. Um, pain and suffering is on the increase, unfortunately, in this time and age. But God's promises are also on the increase. So there's something to look forward to in that. Um, this is not God's will, but God's will for this breakdown in society and the things that are happening. His will, as far as we know, and according to His word, is good, pleasing, and perfect. Um, so, nations and fam nations are made up of what? Families and societies. We need to understand where the enemy likes to deceive, and that starts in the family. Um, it starts between two people, it carries on working through the family, it ends up working through the city, the society you're living in, and then it ends up working through the nation. A child expects the good of their parents. Um, you know, any, if it's healing, if it's finance, it's, the parents got it sorted out. 
You know, according to a 10 year old, the parent has got it sorted out. So we, as adults, need to be like children. We need to expect the good, the fun, and the joy that the, our Father in Heaven has in store for us. A 10 year old walks around seeking joy, seeking happiness. When they're sitting at home doing nothing, and they get bored, then they start getting depressed. And then they start getting annoyed, and then they start crying, and they want this and they want that. The parents, what do they do? They run out to get them the ice cream, they run out to buy them the gift, they run out to get them clothes or whatever. You know, children know what their parents are going to do. We, as adults, need to be 10 year olds and know what our Father wants to do, our Heavenly Father. Um, so, let us expect God, our Heavenly Daddy, to take care of the healing, to take care of our food, our clothes, our finances, and let us expect His good, pleasing, and perfect will. It's His promise. Your Father in Heaven wants you, though, first to become a child. Um, so we're going to take a little time now to pray together. Um, I want you to think of yourselves as 10 year olds. You know, there's no adults in this place today. The children have remained in here, so the adults become children today. Um, and what I want, we're going to start off with is we're going to ask God to bless our family. Each one of you here today are going to intercede for your family. You're going to pray for your children, you're going to pray for your parents and your relatives. And then you're going to pray for the city that you're living in. You're going to pray for the village you're living in, depending where you're living on the island. And then we're going to pray for the nation of Cyprus. Now, there's of course a lot of foreigners in Cyprus and the church is made up of a lot of foreigners, but not many Cypriots. But you are here for a reason. And that reason is God put you here today for this island. He put you here to intercede for this island. If you change this island, do you know what an impact you'll have across the world and in your own nation? So I want you to, to all stand up and pray. We're going to pray. So you don't think there's a time limit. Whenever the music finishes, is when you can start finishing off. But otherwise we won't be out one day because there's a lot to pray for. So I want to ask you to just allow the Holy Spirit to lead you in prayer. And remember, it's about your family, it's about your city, and it's about this country. And, and be children. You know, what you ask for, be expectant that God's going to deliver. He is your Father. He is your Heavenly Father. And He wants to give you what you want. Just as you want to give your child what they want. So... Nothing is too big and nothing is too small. What you ask for, God can deliver. He is the Almighty One, He is the Great I Am, and He is the perfect person, the perfect priest. So let's just take this time now and call on our God to change this nation.
can be seen through. It is something you must understand is our nation needs healing. This nation needs healing. It's not only about the family, it's not only about society. If you can change a nation, you know how much of an impact this nation, this island will have across the world. You know, look at your family, look at the little village, your neighbors, and you know, just look at that, change that. Bring God in that place, and you'll be amazed as to how your city will change, and then how, you know, just the country can change. You know, Black Greg kept on talking about Pastor Greg. <laughs> kept on talking about, you know, pray for your government. You know, you've got to pray for your government. How are we going to change the nation if we can't pray for our government? It's important that we pray for our government. It doesn't matter who's in power. It's not about politics. It's about that they have the authority to bring forth a change in the country. So if we can pray for them, and ask the Lord to transform their understanding, to renew their mind with the Word of God. Imagine the change that can come about over the country. So please understand, it's important during your prayers to continue to allow God to speak to you and you know, ask Him, how should I pray for my country? What should I be praying about today? Ask Him, it could be about a certain thing, it could about, be about a certain law that's going to come and change. You know, is it a law that is abiding to God's word or is it a law that is abiding to Satan's word? You know, we need to intercede. We need to say, yes, Lord, let this, let this change come. Or no, Lord, this is against your word. Let it not come through. I mean, we look at, I mean, uh, because I, I know more news about the UK and the States than I know about Europe. So looking at the States, you can see certain laws that have come into place and they're against God's word. They're against God's word. Nation has to, I and mean, we are the people that have to intercede and pray that these sort of laws and things do not come into being because it's not from God. So please, I, I just urge you, as, as much as you pray for your everyday needs, pray for this nation so that you can see and experience the change that a country or an island like this can do. Um, that's the first part. <laughs> of the service. So the importance there is to become a child during your prayer and to always be a child and expect your father to give you what you want. And the importance of our nation that needs healing because that's how you're going to affect the changes around you and the changes in this world. Now I want to take it to another level, a more personal level. That's as an individual, not, not as a nation. And what I'm going to read from is Matthew 24, no sorry, Matthew 4, verse 23 to 24. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. And he healed them. Healing every disease and sickness. And sorry, I just want to go back to Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing and perfect will. This is for each one of you. Also for each person outside this building, across the city, across the continent, and across the world. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is God's promise. God loves His creation. God is in love with you. You've got to get that understanding. God, the Almighty One, is in love with each one of you. 
His presence is here today because He wants to be with you. He chooses to want to be with you. Each one of you. Now let's just see Jesus' love because something important we need to remember is written in John 14, 12 to 14. Just so you think, so you see, I'm not bringing you something here out of my own understanding. I'm bringing you God's word. This is why I keep referring to the scripture. I don't want you to think this is Philip speaking. This is God's word. You can take it home, test it, read about it, and allow the Holy Spirit to let you know if I'm telling the truth or not. <laughs> you know, this is why I keep referring to the scriptures. So John 14 verses 12 to 14. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. The amazing thing is, you will do the works I have been doing. Not to mention the greater things, but you will do the works that I have been doing. So what works has Jesus been doing? There are so many. I'm going to read a few. Um, and uh, now let this register with you. This is what Jesus has been doing and this is the works that he wants us to be doing. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with Matthew 8, 2-3. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cured of his leprosy. Luke 17, 12-14 As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go. Show yourselves to the priests, and as they went, they were cleansed. Matthew 8, 16 to 13. This is one of my favorite ones. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in, a te and in terrible suffering. Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished, and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west, and take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it will be done just as you believed it would. And the servant was healed at that very hour. Matthew eight fourteen to 15 When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she got up and began to wait on her. Simple. Um, Matthew eight sixteen. When evening came, many who were demon possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with the word and healed all the sick. Matthew nine two to seven. I'm not going to read it all. Uh, some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, "Take heart, son. Your your sins are forgiven." And then the man got up and went home. Nice. <laughs> and then Matthew 9, 23 to 25. When Jesus entered the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd, he said, go away, the girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. We can go on and on and on and see all these miracles that Jesus did. 
the leper in Galilee, the, Ro the Roman centurion which we just read about, the, um, Peter's mother-in-law, sick with fever, man with a withered hand, a dead son of the widow of Nain, Jairus' daughter in, at Capernaum, woman with the issue of blood, deaf man with speech impediment in the region of Decapolis, blind man at Bethsaida, other blind men, two blind men at Capernaum, other women and Mary Magdalene healed of evil spirits and infirmities, few sick per a few sick persons healed in Nazareth, people with epileptic, uh, epilepsy, epilepsy, Lazarus, of course, you know, so you can see there is not much that Jesus did not do. Yet he says in John 14 verse 12, Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. Then goes on to say, And will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. What I would like here is just to look quickly at John 5.19. He says, Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth, the son, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. Whatever the father does, the son also does. So, just to go back. He says to us, um, and will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. What I like here in this verse, John 5, 19, is where he says, um, He only does what he sees the Father doing. He only does what he sees the Father doing. Yeah. Yet in John 14, 12, he says, Whoever believes in me will do these things. Then goes on to say, Because I am going to the Father. So, do you see the importance it is to believe in Jesus in order to do His works and greater things? He is the mediator between man and God, as it says in 1 Timothy. I want to read it to you. 1 Timothy 2.5 2 For there is one God and one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. Um, so we need to come into that place where we will do what we see the Father doing and understand nothing is impossible for our God. So do you have the authority to heal? Yes. yes. If Jesus is the king of your throne, you can do as he does. Do not allow the knowledge of this world cloud the knowledge of the kingdom of God. The two are different. The world tells you you can or cannot do. Tells you things that you can and cannot do. Tells you what is possible. Science tells you what is possible. God's kingdom gives you authority to create. Also to do what is not possible in man's eyes. So how do we pray for healing? It's never the same. There's no formula. But the Holy Spirit does the work. We have to become vessels for God to work through. It's all about being available for Him. We know the symptoms and then ask God how to deal with those symptoms and pray into that. So, of course, you know, somebody's sick. <laughs> If it's a physical ailment, if it's an emotional thing, whatever it is, you ask, you know, what is the problem? And then you're going to pray into that problem and ask God to show how to pray into that problem. He knows the symptom of that problem. We don't know the symptom. We feel the pain. But where the pain has originated from, God knows. And He wants to take away that original section so that that pain does not come back. Remember, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. In the healing rooms, we deal with things slightly differently in that we have teams when we're praying for somebody. Um, somebody will come into the healing room. I don't know if, I don't know if there's some of you here who haven't been to the healing rooms. Um, but basically, in the healing rooms, people will come in and ask for prayer, and then we will go as a team uh, of three people to pray for that person. 
um, in, that, in that prayer time with that person, we're asking for God to lead us. We're not doing things through our own understanding. We need to know what God is thinking, what God is doing. We need to be one with the Father. And we can only do that by knowing our Lord Jesus Christ. Because He's the mediator. He's the one that reveals to us that understanding that the Father has. So, you know, we have to be one with Him first. So this is why it's important as people in the healing rooms to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and to have Jesus living inside them. Because He is the one who is going to heal. It's not Philip. It's not us as people who are doing the healing. Um, so in the healing rooms, we gather in a team of three and we'll go and pray for the person and see how God leads us. But it doesn't mean that you as an individual do not have the authority. God, I just pointed out that God has given you the authority to pray for the sick. We are to be like Jesus. We are to do His works. And we are to do greater things than Jesus did. Now that might be a bit mind-boggling as how can we do greater things? Well, how long are we living on this planet? <laughs> You know, when the average age, you're going to live up to 80, 90, or 100, or 120, I don't know what it is nowadays. But all that time, Jesus, Jesus, well, according to scripture, his ministry, I think, was like for three years or something. So, what is, you know, how much could he do? How much can we do? How much greater works can we do? If Jesus used his time on earth to glorify his Father, then we ought to do the same and do even greater things. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. It's not by your strength, it's not by your wisdom or your knowledge that you're doing things. It's by the God, the Almighty, that you do these things. Um, so in everyday life, when we're sitting around with friends, family, whatever, and somebody says they've got a pain, or somebody is suffering, or you know a relative is in hospital, you, who has asked Jesus into your life to be the King of and on top of the throne in your life, you have the authority to go and pray for that person. You have the authority to go and pray for healing. You have the authority to intercede for that person. The reason I spoke about that one, uh, the, the centurion who went to Jesus, and I find that as my favorite, is because right there it shows that you don't have to be next to the person to pray for that person. You don't have to lay hands on the person to pray for that person. We have a great testimony at the moment, those of you who have been involved in praying for Winnie Fred's husband. Um, we are not at his bedside. We are not praying for him at the bedside. We are standing and interceding from where we are for healing. And the Lord is doing his works. The Father in heaven is listening. And he's, he's reaching out and he's showing us what he can do. So it's very important to know that you don't have to be next to the person to pray for them. But if you can, then we are to lay hands on that person too, as the scripture tells us. And I just want to give you a quick, um, I was trying to find the definition of the, the verb heal. You know, so the word heal used as a verb, in other words, <laughs> um, that is three different types of definitions. Like the one definition is to make healthy, whole or sound, restored to health, free from ailment. Then you've got a second type which is to bring to an end or conclusion a conflict between persons or groups. And then the third one, to free from evil, cleanse and purify. Healing is not just for physical. Healing is for the physical ailment, it's for an emotional ailment, and it's even for financial. Financial comes into, do not worry about the food, the clothes that you're going to wear. Do, do not worry about these things. But we are gripped because Satan likes to deceive us. He brings the importance of you don't have a shirt to wear, or you don't have this or that. Um, and, you know, we... <laughs> We, we know the truth. We know what God has in store for us. His good and pleasing and perfect will. So these are lies that we need to know about. 
And these are lies that we need to pray against and we need to bring the truth to nullify the lie. So, you know, you've got to speak truth. It's not about the food, it's about life. It's not about the clothes, it's about the body. That's the importance. It's what God sees as important. The rest He's going to provide. You know, you just step into God, into God and, and ask Him and He will provide the rest. Remain, recognize who He is. You know, step into His kingdom and forget the kingdom of this world. It's just lies in this world that we keep hearing. Um, so what we're going to do now as a second part is basically we're going to pray for one another. Now I don't know if, there, if there's anybody in this in the congregation today who has, who needs healing. Now whether it's a physical healing, spiritual, uh, a physical healing or emotional or a financial healing or anything else, I want you to stand where you are. Right now. <laughs> if there's anybody who needs to pray for healing. And I also want to ask that if you have children who you feel need prayer for healing, to also stand with the parents. So if there's any children that need prayer for healing, I want you to also stand with your children. Um, I'm not going to pray for each one of you. I want those who are in the vicinity to reach out their hands uh, towards those who are standing. And we are all going to pray together. Now, usually you would go up to that person and ask them why you want to, what, what the prayer is for. We're not going to do that this morning. We're not going to walk up to each person and ask them what the prayer is for. What we're going to do is we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to show us what to pray for them. So I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to, to show you I want you to pick a person in the room and pray for that person, okay? So while you're praying for that person, while you're lifting that person up, I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to show you what it is that God wants to say to that person. What it is God wants to reveal to you to pray into that person's life. And then later, at the end of the service, if God has given you a word for that person, I want you to walk up and give it to that person. There's no pressure here. There's no, you don't have to go and give a word to that person. I'm trusting God to do the works in that person's life. I'm not trusting man. So while we are praying, we are interceding for the people that are standing. And we're going to allow God to do His works in that person's life. And I'm expecting deliverance here today. I'm expecting God to work into each one of your lives. Those of you who are standing, I'm expecting God to bring healing in that place you are seeking it. And I'm expecting God to just show you His ways and not the world's ways. So I am trusting God to do His works here today. It's not about man, it's not about me, it's not about us. So um, again, Amanda and Mary will sing a song and we will go into a time of prayer. Um, I, I'm going to switch off my mind just so that I can pray out loud. And I just want you to pray out loud. I want you to pray out silently, whatever, is, whatever it is. But please just reach your hands out to those who are standing. If you want, you can go and stand next to them and pray with them. I do ask, I, I, it's not something we always say, but I do ask that if you're a person who has asked Jesus into your life and that He is your Savior and the King of your throne, then to please lay your hands on that person. If you have not asked Jesus into your life, then I would ask that you don't lay your hands on that person. Because remember, I want to go by God's word, that He says, those who believe in me. And he, we will do the same works that He does. So, we will go into prayer now. Thank you.
Thank you. 